Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. On today's show, we're talking about the gold rush that happens in virtually every new market innovation. We saw it with the railway, automobiles, radio, television, personal computers, the internet, and now cannabis. When a new market is developing, there's a major opportunity for new entrants to grab market share in a growing market. When you layer the growth upon growth, you've got potential for hypergrowth. These market conditions have attracted entrepreneurs since the beginning of time. There's another element to the emerging market. Nobody really knows where the equilibrium between supply and demand will emerge when the market stabilizes. We know that demand is growing, but so too is the supply. Will the market stabilize with a healthy market for all players? Will the market saturate to the point where it's oversupplied and nobody's making any money? Well, if you're a student of history, you'll see a familiar pattern. It's a rush to entry with a brief period of healthy growth, followed by market saturation, followed by consolidation as the weaker players are forced to close. Only after the maturation of the second wave of growth do the markets actually start to experience sustainable business. In the late 1800s, there were numerous steam-powered vehicles in production. The number of startup companies had ballooned to more than 100, and in the early 1900s, there were steam-powered vehicles, internal combustion automobiles, and even some electric models. They were all competing for market share. The legacy of those days is best seen in the modern-day General Motors company. In 1908, the company was formed, and on the very next day, they acquired the Buick Motor Company. They then went on to acquire another 20 companies, including Oldsmobile, Cadillac, Carter Car, Elmore, Oakland, which was later renamed Pontiac. They acquired Reliance, Rapid Motors. You probably never heard of some of these. At the height of the personal computer industry, there were also hundreds of PC manufacturers. It was Olivetti, Atari, Radio Shack, Osborne, Compaq, Gateway, Wang, Apricot, Sanyo, and of course IBM. There's simply too many to name. Most of them are gone from the market today. The product has been commoditized and the manufacturers have consolidated to a small number of high-volume contract manufacturers, largely in Taiwan and China, that have the lowest cost structures to meet the quality requirements. Today, all of the top 10 brand-name computer companies have all partnered with the same manufacturing partner out of Taiwan. That means the computers sold by HP, Panasonic, Dell, Microsoft are all made in the same facility by the same company. As the industry matured, Companies could no longer show investors the kind of growth that would justify the earnings multiple being attached to those tech companies. In any industry, the original excitement and investment that surrounds sudden growth needs to be backed by continuous expansion of company earnings if that value is going to be held over the long term. In the case of the cannabis industry, far too much money was spent on building infrastructure. Enormous investments in technology, packaging, regulatory lobbying, and adjustments to the new and ever-changing regulatory environment. All of this happened without showing investors much in the way of profits. Retail channels in states and provinces where the sale of cannabis products have been legalized, they've expanded rapidly. Major investments have been made in the growth of production capacity, and most companies have entered the space overestimating the market share they can realistically achieve. For example, in the province of Ontario, where I live, there's a proliferation of licensed dispensaries. In my home city, Cannabis consumers purchased more than $13 million worth of legal pot from authorized retailers in the first quarter of this year. That's according to newly published figures from the province. The numbers show that while sales revenues have remained relatively constant over the past year, the number of retailers in my home city has multiplied from 7 in the first quarter of 2020 to 28 in the same period this past year. All other things being equal, revenues would be expected to fall by 75% for those original seven stores if the retail business was to be equally distributed among the stores. So you're probably wondering what all of this has to do with real estate. Well, I'm glad you asked. See, the cannabis industry has a heavy real estate component. So if you're investing in the agricultural land for growing cannabis products, saturation in the market means that the land value is going to fall. This shouldn't be a surprise. We saw the same thing happen in California a few years ago. If you're a commercial landlord and you've signed a five-year or 10-year lease with a small licensed retailer, you should expect you're at a high risk of that business not being profitable and closing its doors before the end of the lease term. This is no different if you rented a manufacturing space to a new electric car startup. The chances are high that those businesses will not survive. It's only the well-capitalized, well-managed companies that have developed strong brand recognition with customers. They're the ones that will ultimately reap the rewards once the industry period of saturation and consolidation takes place. 
as you think about that. Have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.